What's up, Watch Geeks? I'm Christian, the guy who answers your emails at info at theoandharris.com. We are launching our new video series right now called Ask TNH, where every week we're going to be answering the questions that you asked throughout the week about uh, collectability, repairs, just vintage watches as a whole and the whole world that surrounds it. Uh, we'll answer two questions and then end with one of our reactions to something that happened throughout the week. This week, we'll be talking about investability in vintage watches, repairs and the world that surrounds repairs, and my reaction to to the Hermes Apple Watch. You ask questions and I answer them. Kind of like Gary Vee, but like for watches. I get emails every week, including the last week when we announced we're going to do this video series, asking basically, okay, I'm really into watches, this is my hobby, uh, I cannot afford a hundred, I can't afford all the, you know, the watches I want, uh, but I want to keep playing the game, you know, because we know we flip, you know, everyone keeps rolling and, and they buy something, they love it, they wear it for a year and they want to get a new one, so how do I not lose money? And it, sometimes it's not always a matter of making money, it's just not losing it, you know, basically how can this watch be a small bank account, you know, uh, and not actually just depreciate when I wear it like so many modern watches do. So for that reason, investability. Right now, the first thing that comes to my mind with investability is vintage manual one chronographs from the 60s and the 70s from, uh, from, you know, lower brands. Brands that are in the price range of, let's say, $800 to $1,500. That to me is that sweet spot. You know, that 700 bucks can buy you uh, some sick panda dials, things that I know will not only be worth the same, but more in the next, you know, two, three years to come. So why? Uh, following examples of the market, Rolex 6263s, Rolex Daytonas, uh, these watches are I mean, value movements. These are, these are not extraordinarily made watches. Yes, the design is brilliant and the marketing you know, has the crown and all that stuff and that's great. But ultimately, you're still buying a relatively standard watch that is worth only a couple thousand dollars. However, they now are priced into the 30s, 40s, 50s, depending on dial you know, uh, configuration. You're talking $100,000 for some of them. What's up, Paul Newman? And, you know, and there are other brands too. You talk about Hure, uh, Universal Geneve. Universal Geneve is a good one because that's a relatively recent one. They didn't skyrocket until a certain, you know, group of bloggers decided, hey, you know, these are really cool undervalued watches, I mean, like appropriately valued watches, let's make them popular and skyrocket. So basically, how are we going to position ourselves on the, you know, pre-skyrocketed price? How do we get in there? It's predicting which watches are next. Because you can no longer really buy a vintage Universal Geneve and make that you know, pop unless you're, you know, in some Italian flea market in southern Rome. I have no idea. Um, so the way we, the way I do it at least, is I look for the qualities that are found in the watches that have already taken these jumps, like panda dials, you know, red, blue instrumentations that remind me of pre-Daytonas, uh, things that are reminiscent of those expensive watches at a lower price. So if I can find myself a panda dial uh, chronograph with a Valjoux 7733 uh, like we just sold to someone in Larchmont uh, yesterday, that watch represents at you know, close to $1,000 something that will absolutely experience that increase that you'll see in a year, two years, quite frankly in two months sometimes you know, from the right buyer because it's riding the coattails of, of the precedent that's set. You know, so that's kind of, that's what we have to do. So right now, vintage manual wine chronographs with interesting dials, pandas, sunbursts, um, interesting, interesting instrumentations, things like that. That's the stuff to buy right now and, and absolutely ride into, uh, ride into not only not depreciation, but an increase. Okay, so now we're gonna talk about repairs. Um, the reason repairs are so important is because, at least the way we see it, of course we want our watches to work, but further than that, the benefit of buying vintage, uh, at least in our segment, that kind of sub $3,000 market, uh, is value. You know, we're, we are providing or offering a value proposition. Whereas if you go to a modern store and buy a modern watch, you're talking, you know, seven, eight thousand dollars before you even touch something that you really want, right? Because those things are totally inflated and, and please, we can go off on that for, for, for a while. But to maintain that value, you know, you don't want to accrue, you know, fees that are just absurd six, seven, you know, nine months later, two years later, that would blow the value out of the water. You know, a $400 service could take your $800 watch way over, 
you know, it's no, it's no longer, you know, that proposition anymore. So to maintain that value, uh, you have to find a good service center. That's the bottom line. Uh, not only to maintain the value, but to keep your watch going, because that, that beautiful watch that you bought is worth nothing if it's not working, right? So you're lucky to know, or lucky to all know, that these, these watches will, are always serviceable, you know, there are people in this country, whether it's Memphis Mean Time, whether it's Central Watch Company, uh, there are plenty of people that are skilled enough to know how to, to operate these watches and service them. It's a matter of affordability. That's where the real concern is. Uh, and it's, it's hard. There, there, aren't, there aren't prices that you can kind of say, this costs this, you know, uh, because each, each piece of damage, each watch that has a different problem with it, costs a different thing, and depending where you are, if you're in Manhattan, you're going to pay more than you would pay in Tennessee. That's how it is. So I'm not going to say, hey, fixing a wheel train costs whatever, you know, uh, redoing a balance wheel, you know, whatever it is. I, mean, I can't give prices, but as long as you find those people and develop a good relationship with them, you will be in the clear. Uh, yeah, there are, there are plenty of places online where you can research service centers and say, okay, these people are exorbitant. You know, sending a watch to Rolex, I've never done it. Uh, I, I heard it I've heard it's, it's crazy expensive. Uh, there are plenty of places in Manhattan, too, that just hit you over the head. Uh, I can't offer you a service. Uh, we're, we're not a service center. For our, you know, Theo and Harris clients, we do offer service on all watches, you know, whether it's six months, two weeks, or, or three years down the line. We're only eight months old, but I think we're going to be around for the next you know, three, five years. So we will offer service, but my watchmaker would kill me if I just, you know, Jack. Jack would kill me if he just found out that I offered his service out to the you know, whole country. Uh, but uh, the bottom line is these things are serviceable. You don't have to worry about not being able to use them, it's just the cost. And with that, you know, we're always on our email, uh, and there are plenty of people in the watch community that will help you out and advice, uh, giving your location and what's wrong with your watch. You post pictures on forums and stuff like that. You will always be able to repair the watch, uh, and, and probably, if you do your due diligence, get a good price. The Hermes Apple Watch. I think it, it didn't hit stores yet. I don't even, I don't even know. I saw it on Instagram. A couple people already posted some of them. Uh, they, they bought them for their wives or for themselves or whatever it may be. <sighs> Hodiki posted an article um, just to explaining the Hermes Apple Watch and kind of putting it in historical context for Hermes. They, they, they linked watches and the Hermes brand together very strongly, which I don't dispute by any means, but I think that it's more so Hermes and not watches, but products that are timeless and of equal quality to Hermes. I don't think that it was Hermes and watches are brothers. I think it's Hermes stands for quality product, you know, brilliantly produced, you know, artisanship, things like that. Universal Geneve, also quality produced, something that will last you for the next 60 years. People are still wearing tricompaxes. People are still wearing, you know, uh, Hermes belts from, from the 70s. That's how it is. That's what those two companies stood for even if Universal Geneva no longer exists. With the Apple Watch, I think that that tie with watches and Hermes is, is dissolved. I don't think it's timeless by any means. I think it's very timeful, if that's a thing. Um, I think that the Hermes Apple Watch is not different. I, it, w w what did they really change? They added a, a dial configuration that has the Hermes stamp on it. I think really the only thing they offered was this, was this value proposition. I think it's a valueless value proposition uh, where they said, hey, you can own something Hermes for $1,100 uh, and get an Apple product. Uh, I don't think you'll be wearing it in six months. I don't think you'll care. It's not, I, don't, I don't think it's a cool thing. The value that Hermes added to them, apart of branding, I mean, I think Hermes is going to absolutely bring up the value of that Apple Watch because they're going to target my mom. You know, they're going to target 45-year-old how's about 45 year old women uh, who say, oh my God, I love Hermes, I have the bracelets, I have all this ridiculousness. Oh, maybe I want an Apple Watch now. So it, it definitely does focus the market a little more. Uh, I guess also 20 somethings too, probably, but I, 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 don't, I don't see it. I, don't, I definitely don't like it as a consumer. Um, and I, I, I like Hermes. The straps, you know, another thing that everyone was talking about was you're mixing, you know, uh, the highest quality of leather straps with some of the greatest innovation around. Another thing, I, 
Hermes straps are great. There is no, there's no dispute. I've owned an Hermes strap. I, I, I love Hermes leather. It, it's nice stuff. But for, I mean, what do they go for? Four, five, six. I had a crocodile strap in my hand for like seven hundred and fifty dollars, eight hundred and twenty-five dollars, something you know, ridiculous like that. When you can go to a great maker like Jean Rousseau in Manhattan. Shout out John Rousseau. Follow John Rousseau on Twitter and Instagram. Uh, buy one of their straps. A calf strap is like ninety dollars, uh, custom made to, to your specifications. So why would I, you know, spend four or five hundred on a strap? Even if it's maybe slightly better. Maybe if I had, you know, an absurd amount of money that didn't really matter. Sure, but you know, if you are conscious of what you're spending and you do care, I don't think the value's there. I. I I know the value isn't there. Uh, that's, 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 that's just how I feel. Um, it, it's a great product. It's cool looking, but ultimately, I think it's value less. It is time full, and uh, I, I mean, I wouldn't own one. And I fucking love Hermes. <laughs> All right, guys, thank you for tuning in to the first episode of Ask TNH. Shoot us your questions. Uh, you can hashtag Ask TNH on Instagram. I'll follow it. Uh, uh, shoot us an email at info at theoneris.com. I will personally answer, as I always do, within 15 minutes. And, uh, and that's it. Thanks for watching. We'll see you guys next week.